You know, one of the great things about studying the questions Jesus asked is they teach us about ourselves, but they also teach us a lot about him. It's true, his questions give us insight into who he is and what he cares about. And this morning, only three words, a very short question. Who touched me? What was Jesus trying to communicate? Let's explore it together. story we're looking at this morning, the question that confused the disciples is found in the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In Matthew chapter 9, Mark chapter 5, and Luke chapter 8, they all tell a very similar story. We'll reference uh, some of the other accounts just so we get a well-rounded understanding of the scene and all that was taking place, but our main text will be out of Mark chapter 5, verse 25 is where we'll begin. Familiar story for many. Mark chapter 5, verse 25, you'll see that it begins in the middle of a section. What has taken place in Mark 5 <clears throat> is that in uh, pretty early on in Jesus' ministry, He is incredibly popular. People are are pressing around him. They want to be around him. They want to hear him. They want to see some of the miracles that he's performing. So he is incredibly popular right now with the people, though unpopular with the religious leaders of the day. But as he's going through, there there are crowds pressing in on him because they want to see again and hear uh, the kingdom of God. And there's a man that comes to request Jesus to heal his sick daughter. So this is a a situation that's taking place. As he's coming through, Jesus gets this request. And then in the middle of this request, as he's going to fulfill this request of this man to visit his daughter and to heal her, this scene takes place. So there are really several moving parts in the story. Jesus is going to heal this man's daughter, and along the way, this happens. Mark 5, verse 25, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. And she had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if... I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately, the flow of blood dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. What an, an amazing story. This nameless, faceless woman is, has this story that's told in all three accounts of the four Gospels, almost word for word. This was an incredibly popular story that's taking place. This was an, a huge event in gospel literature, for it to have so much ink as this. And yet at the very heart of this story lies a question. Who touched me? Now for those of you that have been with this series very long, we've learned that the questions Jesus asked were never for his own benefit. They were always for the benefit 
of his listener. Now, that may be the listener of the day, the one who, who was asked the question. It may have been for the crowds that were around. Um, it may have even been for us down through the corridors of time that would benefit from the questions of Jesus. But he never asked them because there was a deficit of knowledge on his part. Because Jesus, as God, is omniscient and he knows all things. So he gives us this awesome opportunity to look at this question and say, if Jesus wasn't asking this question because he needed to know, then why did he ask it? And, and it really shines bright here because we know that he knows who touched him. We know that he knows why she touched him. So we get to explore the reason why did Jesus ask that question that confused the disciples. But before we do, let's look at the woman. This story is beloved by many who have read the scriptures. This story is, is for some of you, it's your favorite. And I think it's our favorite for some reason because of the human drama. Because on some level, we may be able to relate to this woman whose story is told three different times in the Gospels. And I want us to get a good look at this woman who Jesus calls out in the middle of this story. The first was this. We've learned from Matthew, Mark, and Luke three things that we'll add a fourth one in a moment. We learned three things, the first of which is she was broken. This woman's body didn't work. Now, there's an interesting connection here in this particular account of Jairus and his daughter, who was 12 years old and was lying at the point of death. And then this woman enters in, and we learn from this that she had been had this issue of blood for 12 years. Her body didn't work right. So where one was alive and then became, was, was dying, this one was dying when she comes to Jesus for 12 years. But her body didn't work right. She knew that there was an issue. She was losing blood. And the Bible tells us that it only grew worse. It didn't get better. Now, you might be able to relate to that in some level. You may look at your body physically. You may look at maybe your relationship with God spiritually. You may be looking at your, your house relationally. You may be looking at your checkbook financially. You may be in a situation where you're, you're not getting better. Things are getting worse. You've been there before probably when you were sick. And instead of getting better immediately, you got worse. Let me tell you something. I just came back from the dentist last week, and I was at the dentist because of my negligence, guys. I'm just going to be honest. It all would have been much better had I just bit the bullet and went to the dentist. But I didn't. And my situation kept getting worse and worse. Yes, if I could have only touched the hem of his garment... You've been there before, though, didn't you? Haven't you? The situation wasn't getting better. It wasn't up and to the right. It was down and to the left. Your relationship was getting more and more sour. Your job situation was getting worse and worse. Your physical health was getting worse and worse. Your emotional stability was getting worse and worse. And all the while, you wanted it to get better. You had a plan to get better, but it didn't. It got worse. This woman was broken. Her body did not work and function the way it was supposed to, which led her to the second thing. She was banished. When we read through the Old Testament, we come across some laws that seem strange. We wonder why God would put certain eating restrictions or diet restrictions on His people. We wonder why sometimes God would have certain people uh, stay outside of the camp for so many days. And what does that teach us about God? Well, it teaches us that God is a wise God. That God, knowing that His people were built to, to spend time together, to fellowship together, to eat together, to spend those precious moments together as His people, He knew that there were things that they needed to do in order to remain healthy. 
And one of those we find in Leviticus chapter 15 was special instructions in the law that if a woman had an issue of blood, not just the normal issue of blood, but something beyond the normal issue of blood, she was to be, in a sense, quarantined. Wherever she sat or the bedding that she laid on needed to be washed, she could not come in contact with other people without them having to wash as well. She was literally to be banished. She was to be put aside until the uncleanness was to be taken away. Now, if this is true, think about this for a moment. For 12 years, her condition, no matter how much she wanted it to get better, no matter how much she tried for it to get better, it did not. It only got worse. And to consider for a moment that for 12 years, wherever this woman would go, she would have to announce her uncleanness as she walked into a group. That if she were to come in contact with anybody, she would have to stay a distance away. That, where, that she could not literally embrace or come in close physical contact with other people because of her uncleanness, because of the issue of blood. Let me tell you, our world turned upside down when we could not spend or did not spend close quality time with people for, the, for a matter of months and maybe a year. Can you imagine 12 years of distance? Can you imagine 12 years of not being able to embrace somebody? Can you imagine 12 years because of your body being broken and not working right? Can you imagine that you could never go and worship with brothers and sisters? Can you imagine that you would never be able to be in close proximity with others. She was broken. She was banished. And she was bankrupt. Luke, the physician, records that she spent all of her livelihood on the physicians. Had no money left. Every time she would go with what little money she could have, and she would go into that doctor's office, you know, and hope that something was going to change. I was going to hope that that doctor may be able to do some kind, practice some kind of medicine that might change her situation because then all of her life would change. If she would now no longer have the issue of blood, she would now no longer be broken and banished and bankrupt. But here she is. Here's the human drama. This woman hears that Jesus is coming and she's heard what he's done. And this broken, banished, bankrupt woman shows us something else about her. And it's number four. She's bold. You know why I say that? Let's be honest. None of us want to be broken. We don't want broken bodies. We don't want broken relationships. We don't want broken homes. None of us want that. None of us want to be banished. We all want to know that in a moment we can embrace or, or be close to anybody that we want. We don't ever want to be alone. None of us want to be bankrupt. We all want to make sure that we have sufficient for today and the months that lie ahead, right? We want to know that we have plenty of money and resources to be able to get us by. We want that. None of us want to be broken or banished or bankrupt. But let's be honest. Let's be really honest here. If this woman wasn't broken, she wouldn't have found herself where she was. If this woman hadn't been banished, she wouldn't have been where she was. If this woman had not been bankrupt, she would have kept giving her money to the doctors and never gotten any better. The truth of the matter is, even though none of us want to be broken, banished, or bankrupt, it was those three things that produced in her a boldness. Uh, I've got to do something. It's not getting better, it's getting worse. And now I'm friendless and penniless, and now I'm bloodless. I'm about to die. Something's got to happen. And I would imagine that if you go back into your life in the moments when you took the greatest leaps of faith, it may have possibly been that you had nowhere else to turn. 
That because of your brokenness, because of your banishment, because of your bankruptcy, you had within you a boldness to say, what else do I got to lose? I have nothing else. And this woman marches down the street behind Jesus and offers him nothing but shame and a long list of previous failures. That's it. When I say that she was bold, it says in verse 28, she said, if even I touch his garments, I will be made well. That's what the English says. If even I touch his garments, I will be made well. But that's not how it was written in the original language. In the Greek, the tense of the verb is different. She is not saying, if even I touch his garment, I will be made well. She's saying, if even I touch his garment, I will be made well. If even I touch his garment, I will be made well. If even I touch his garment, I will be made well. That woman was repeating it over and over. In the Greek, it was continual action on her part. She was taking every step, looking at that garment, getting closer, telling herself, if I just touch it, I'll be made well. If I just touch it, I'll be made well. Friends, that was not just a plan. That was her path. She was going to get there. Number two, the question was confusing. Yes, the woman was desperate, but the question was confusing. Several things that we should notice is that Jesus knew someone touched him. Isn't it cool that Jesus, who had all of the resources needed, still knew exactly where every one of those resources went the moment someone touched him with faith he knew that healing virtue had left many were touching him that day but only one was healed many were close to him but truly only one was blessed I don't know at times whether I should say that this woman's faith was imperfect or incredible. I can't tell you which. One thing I want to tell you is this. She had an amazing amount of faith to believe that I don't even have to touch him. I can touch the clothes He's wearing. One commentator said that if Jesus' clothes could share in his glory, then why could they not also share in his healing? Wow, remember when he went on the Mount of Transfiguration and was transfigured in front of them in Matthew 17, Peter, James, and John? He was glorified in front of them and his clothes shined like lightning. This woman may not have had the best plan, but she did the best with what she knew. Please hear this. She did the best with what she knew. How do I know that? Because all she had were doctors before. And she knew that doctors are supposed to be able to fix what's broken in our body. So I'm going to go to the doctor. And for 12 years, she gave them everything she had until she had no more. She did the very best she could. But then Jesus, she hears that he's coming and she goes. Now let's get to the heart in our third and final point this morning. Why did Jesus ask the question? The reason, I believe, is amazing for several reasons. We can't look and say that Jesus specifically said, this is why I'm asking this question. Because he doesn't say it. But we can infer from what we find in the Scriptures and what we know about God elsewhere, we can take from this and say, okay, this lines up with everything else we know about God. And we're able to extrapolate from that that, God had, that Jesus asked this question for these reasons. Number one, it, he wanted to reveal that it was her faith that healed her. That's what he does. Who touched me? Everybody stops. 
The disciples don't understand. There are people touching you all over, and you want to know who touched you. Jesus was able to distinguish between a touch and a touch. And that woman who touched him, and the healing virtue leaves him by his own will, of course. He knew that woman. He knew before she was born, let alone before she was sick. He knew she was coming before she ever knew she was coming. He was aware of all that was taking place, and no doubt allowed that healing virtue to leave. And as he's walking, and he stops and says, who touched me? Do you notice what he does? He pivots back to the woman. And he commends her for her faith. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Jesus is making sure that she knows that he is commending her faith. So I believe one of the reasons why Jesus asked the question was, to, was a commendation on her part for her faith. Though, though maybe different than most everybody else, she heard of what Jesus had done. She followed Jesus. She went to Jesus, and she touched Jesus, and she was healed. Every bit of that required faith. By the way, let me interject something. You may never know the power of how God wants to use a testimony of what he's done in your life. That woman found herself at the feet of Jesus healed, because she had heard the stories of him healing other people. Never be afraid to share the testimonies of what God has done in your life because there may be other people who may hear it and make an act of faith on their own behalf off of the testimony of what God did in your life. It revealed that it was her faith that healed her. A commendation. Number two, I believe it was a validation. Jesus wanted to validate that this woman was truly healed. Oh. I think it's safe for us to say that for 12 years, those fingers couldn't touch anybody. She knew that. Let alone teacher, let alone a rabbi. What do you think, what do you think her, her thoughts were when she hatched this plan to sneak along covered up so nobody would recognize her and make her way through the crowd and then Jairus comes and he's got Jesus' attention and now she knows he's going to be going off to her house so now she's got to she's got to really do it because he's getting ready to leave so she lunges up and just touches either the hem of his garment or the tassel hanging off she just grabs it and as she's turning to make her way she hears Jesus say who touched me the voice rising above every other voice. Who touched me? And you know, you have to believe for a moment she had to have frozen in fear. Jesus was calling her out on the one thing she was not allowed to do, to touch of her uncleanness. She couldn't touch. And she does. And what happens? She's hoping to get healed and to turn and to run off into obscurity. But no, Jesus would have none of it. Who touched me? And in my mind, I imagine she turned around with terror in her eyes until she hears Jesus say, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. You see, all that woman had ever heard for the 12 years before that was go. Get out of here. You're not supposed to be here. Jesus doesn't send her away in banishment. He sends her away in a commission. Gives her purpose and meaning. Jesus wanted to show everybody around that this woman was truly healed. She could get back to life. She could get back into interaction with other people. That one who was broken is broken no more. The one that was banished is banished no more. She didn't want the scorn, the rebuke, the glares, the judgment. She didn't want any attention. She didn't want a scene or to be seen. But Jesus wouldn't let her just slip away. 
I don't think there was just commendation and validation. The third and final one, I think, is probably the most important to me. And I believe it was a reason for identification. This woman who had nobody now had somebody. In fact, this woman who was literally an outcast, not due to any problem of her own, not any actions of her own doing, but because of her health, found herself as an outcast. I want you to consider something this morning. When Jesus turns to this woman, He gives her a title that He gives to no one else in the Gospels. No one. Not Mary and Martha. Not the woman that came up and anointed Him with oil before His burial. Not the women who came to the tomb. No, not them. Jesus turns to the woman who was broken and banished and bankrupt and healed. And he says, daughter. Nowhere else does Jesus use that term but here. Friends, Jesus stopped the crowd got all of their attention on this woman because he wanted her to know that her faith saved her. He wanted her to know that she was truly healed and everybody to know that she was truly healed. And I believe he wants us to know that he is willing and eager to associate with anybody. The whosoevers in Scripture really are whosoevers. Now let me tell you this. This question... Who touched me? Though it may have confused the disciples, it shouldn't confuse us. You know why? God has been doing that the literal entire time. He has been asking those kinds of questions. He has been working this out, I promise you, from the point of the Garden of Eden. Let me take you back for a quick moment to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve have created as the pinnacle of God's creation. And God tells them, you can eat of any tree in the garden you wish, but not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. You know the story that the devil in the form of a serpent, being more subtle than any beast of the field, came and tempted Eve, and she ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She gives to her husband, and he eats... And immediately they look and they see that they are naked. They are now seeing themselves differently and they're ashamed. The book of Genesis tells us that they hear the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And those who used to run to God make clothes out of fig leaves sewn together and run and hide in the trees from His voice. They run from Him. Do you remember the very first question God ever asks. Where are you? God was telling Adam. God knew where Adam was. God planted the tree that Adam was hiding behind. God was saying, where are you, Adam? Because he wanted to know that Adam was worth looking for. He wanted Adam to know, you're running away from me, but I'm running to you, Adam. He said, Adam, where are you? Because he wanted Adam to come out from the trees, come out from the darkness and into the light. Guys, that's what God has been doing throughout the history of the world. He's always been calling us out Where are you, he says to a lost world. He pursues us. He runs after us. He initiates a relationship. He calls us out from darkness. He calls us out from condemnation. He calls us out from sin. Or as Peter says in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, he's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. The church, by definition, ecclesia, literally means called out ones. And aren't you glad there's coming a day 
or that trump will resound and every born-again believer will take to the skies, we will be called out yet once again. Amen? God has always been calling His people out, and He does it here with this woman. Where are you? Who touched me? No, it wasn't for His benefit. He wanted them to come out. I think sometimes in our journey with Christ, we get the word personal and private mixed up. Yes, our faith relationship with Christ is personal, but it's never been called to be private. Jesus is calling us to step out of obscurity, like this woman to come and say, this is what Jesus did in my life. I mean, I'm healed. He did it right here. This is it. I spent all my money on doctors. They couldn't do anything. And I decided one day that I was just going to throw it all at him. And I came and I touched his garment and I'm healed. And now I'm different. That's what happened at the roadside that day. Jesus is not looking for anything else than for us to step out of obscurity. Did you notice before when she went to the doctors, it cost her everything and cost her doctors nothing. But this time, when she comes to Jesus, it cost her nothing. And it cost Jesus something. Some of that healing virtue left him. Oh, but don't make a mistake about it. When Jesus makes us new, it didn't cost him something. It cost him everything. He laid down his life for you and I. This morning, we're going to be tempted to say this. We're going to be tempted to file this under a salvation message. Don't do that. Don't do that. I pray this morning that there are some that have never trusted Christ that today is the day. Today is the day they say, you know what, I've gone everywhere but Jesus, and that changes right now. But just because you're saved does not mean there are not besetting sins, addictions, habits. And maybe much like this woman, you can relate. You've wanted it to get better. You wanted to not look at that. Or you wanted to not do that. Or you wanted to not think like that. But you're realizing it's not getting better, it's getting worse. Schism, maybe for you it's not about salvation, it's about wholeness. To be able to come to Jesus and say, God, I've shown that I can't get over this myself. I've, I've spent time and resources and trying to get better, but I'm not. I still struggle with what I'm looking at or what I'm saying or what I'm thinking. And, and God, I need your help. There were two words that my pastor said on occasion at the end of a sermon. And it would set my heart to racing. I'm telling you, when God was working on my heart, when my pastor said these two words, it shook me right now. Those were the two words. He would extend an invitation both to the lost and to the saved and encourage us to get our lives right and then all be doggone if he did not say, would you do that right now? And when he would say right now, it would shake me out of my desire to put it off. It would shake me out of my desire to comfort myself with the idea that I'll do it next week. And when he would say right now, it reminded me it was of the prime importance in my life to take care of the issues that God has called me to take care of right now. That woman is an, is an example of doing it right now. Jesus was walking by. She knew it. And she responded to it. Seek the Lord while he may be found. That does not mean that he disappears. It means that there are certain conditions and situations in our life where we are more receptive. So let me ask you, if there is an issue in your life that you've been struggling with and you need help to overcome, will you do it right now? Will you make that commitment right now? Will you seek the Lord right now? Will you confess that to the Lord Right now, if you've never trusted Christ, not tomorrow, not next week, would you do it right now? 
Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings.